again and welcome to week three of Introduction to Psychology, Psychology 101. Again, for this week, if you guys see week three do, click on this, it'll tell you what you guys have to do. So today we're going to be studying chapter four. So you guys have read chapter four. Uh, you're going to watch the week three lecture video, which is what we're watching right now. You're going to post a response to the discussion three board. And you have your first quiz this week, but because of the uh, changes going on, they decide this week you have to schedule an appointment at the LRC, okay? And so again, each module, you guys will find your uh, the lecture video, you'll find your presentation, and again, you have your chapter three presentation here. It is kind of extended into this week because it's pretty in-depth chapter, chapter three and four. A lot of biology going on and consciousness and pretty interesting stuff. Uh, but again, this week we're doing sensation and perception and just kind of continuing our consciousness level. Um, you do have quiz one here. So here's your quiz one study guide in your quiz one. And for this, you're going to need an access code, which is why you have to go down to the LRC. Okay. So for our presentation this week, we're going to be studying sensation and perception, which is the most awesome chapter ever. Um, this was my favorite class in college. It was the hardest one I took because I'm not very good with the anatomy and physiology. There's, you know, everyone's got their specialty. I like race class, social psychology, things like that. That's really where I'm at. But the biology is just incredible uh, when it comes to psychology. And you have to know a lot about biology just to make sense of how the brain works, for example. So this one, we're going to be studying sensation and perception, which is really just how is it that you're mind senses the environment and is stimulated by the environment and then how it perceives that information to make it into a big picture so that you can make sense of it all. So this one we're going to be looking at the five senses and then how the brain interprets the senses and then how it perceives, becomes aware of the senses. Okay, so sensation and perception. Sensation is converting energy from the environment into a pattern response by the nervous system, okay? And then perception, in contrast, is interpreting that sensation, becoming aware through the senses, okay? So for example, when light hits your eye, the light hitting your eye is the sensation. And then you recognizing the object that is reflecting the light, that is perception, okay? And the idea is that light is a stimuli, just like uh, touch or smell or hearing or taste, okay? These are all stimuli from the environment that we have receptors waiting to be stimulated by the stimuli, okay? And then those receptors, when stimulated, then send signals to our brain to tell us what we're hearing, smelling, touching, tasting, okay, and seeing. Okay. So when it comes to light, and again, a little bit of physics always blended in along with some chemistry and some biology when it comes to psychology. Because again, what's a neurotransmitter but a chemical signal, right? You know? Okay, so light exiting receptors in your eye. That's what the, I'm sorry, exciting receptors in your eye. What light does is it excites the receptors waiting in your eye, okay? It stimulates the receptors sitting in your eye. So the electromagnetic spectrum is a continuum of all frequencies of radiated energy, okay? However, humans can only see between 400 nanometers and uh, 700 nanometers, okay? So that's our visible spectrum. We can't see beyond that, okay? Light is visible because we have receptors in our eyes that respond to these specific wavelengths, okay? So we have receptors in our eyes that respond to the wavelengths of blue, yellow, and green. So light enters the eye through the pupil that adjusts for the desired amount of light. The light then passes through the vitreous humor, is focused by the lens and the cornea, and strikes the retina. The retina consists of visual receptors that respond to specific wavelengths. When stimulated, the neuron receptors release neurotransmitters to send signals about stimuli to the brain. So again, I've written it out in longhand just so you guys can see what happens. So again, inside your eye on the retina are receptors for blue, green, and yellow, okay? Now, when stimulated by a specific wavelength that excites the neurons to then release neurotransmitters to then send signals all the way up to your brain, okay? And then your brain goes through a whole process of interpreting this information to tell you what you are seeing. And that's how it works, okay? So, the structure of the eye. You have a pupil, that's the opening. The iris is the surface of that that gives it the eye color, okay? The vitreous humor, that's that jelly-like substance in our eye. 
So I, so light is in, allowed in through the pupil, and the pupil kind of opens or closes to determine how much light you need, okay? And then it passes through the vitreous humor. And then in the back of your eye is the retina, which are layers of visual receptors covering the back surface of the eyeball, okay? In the center of the retina, the back of your eye, um, you have the uh, fovea. And so the fovea is the central area of the human retina. And that's where you have nothing but cones sitting in there, okay? Color vision, that's the center of your retina. And then the sides of your retina is more focused on your peripheral vision movement, okay? Um, the cornea is a rigid transparent structure on the surface of the eyeball that focuses light. And then the lens also focuses light, okay? So light goes is allowed in through the pupil, okay, passes through the vitreous humor, the jelly-like substance, okay? The uh, cornea and the lens focus the light. Light then hits the receptors on your retina. And again, the center of your retina, the fovea, is the highest concentration, the greatest density of receptors, okay? And they're all for color vision. And the neural pathways going from the fovea to the brain uh, are more dense than other neural pathways of information of light coming into your eyes, okay? And then there's this great little picture down here again. So rays enter the eye, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, cornea and the lens focus it, it hits the back of the eye, and then it gets reflected off its pedum. It gets turns upside down. So you see actually everything upside down. Okay, here's another picture of everything for you. Uh, you will need to know where the retina is, okay? You kind of need to know what rods and cones are. We're about to get into all that, too. So the visual receptors, the retina, okay? And this is a picture of what they look like, the back of the retina, and how it sends information to the axons of the optic nerve, again. So you have your cones, okay? Then they cross through, and eventually the information gets sent on the optic nerve. So the retina contains two types of receptors. There are rods and cones. So again, rods, that's for vision and dim light, Okay? Um, and then cones, that's for color and detail and bright light. 95% of the receptors in your eyes are rods and only 5% are cones, okay? There are three types of cones. There are blue, which, have, which are receptors for short wavelengths, green for medium light wavelengths, and yellow for long wavelengths, okay? Now, the cones, despite being only 5%, compared to the rods, 95%. They still send more signals to the brain than the rods. Um, there's a higher proportion of them as you go toward the center of the retina. And again, the fovea consists exclusively of cones. Okay, so your cones do the color and detail and the rods do movement and being able to see in the dark light. And your book has a lot of really fun examples about like what you can do in the dark, focusing on a red light, how you can improve your rod vision, all of that. Really good fun stuff in there, so make sure you read over that. Uh, rods, though, are more concentrated on the periphery of your eye, okay, where color vision decreases. Because, again, it's focused on movement and uh, being able to see in dim light, okay? Everybody has a blind spot. Your book has that really fun example of where you focus on the lion, the lion's hammer, and then eventually you can't see the lion anymore. So, guys, have some fun with that. Open up your book and just kind of do that thing where you get closer and closer to your book. And then when you can't see it anymore, that's your blind spot. And the reason is you don't have receptors there to be able to see that where that light is coming in because that's where all the uh, information gets sent out to the optic nerve, okay? So there can't be receptors there because that information has to have a place to get out. Okay, so how does color vision work? The process of how the visual system converts wavelengths of light into a perception, okay? An awareness of color begins with three kinds of cones, each sensitive to a particular range of wavelengths. Again, so you have blue, green and red, okay? And each one of those are receptive to a specific wavelength. Again, red light will not stimulate the uh, blue cones, for example. Later cells in the visual path code this wavelength information in terms of pairs of opposites, okay? So your brain doesn't just see the color, your brain has to compare red versus green, yellow versus blue, and white versus black to determine what color it actually is, okay? So you need like a yin and yang kind of thing for your eye to really understand what that color is, okay? And then cells in the cerebral cortex compare the input from various parts of the visual field to synthesize the color experience, to give you a detailed perception of what you are actually seeing, okay? 
So the trichromatic theory is, again, this idea that you have specific cones that are sensitive to specific kinds of lights, S cones for blue, M cones for green, L cones for red, okay, and then each of those cones are receptive to a specific wavelength, okay? That's what that one's all about, and that's a really fun theory to learn about. <clears throat> all right, then you have opponent process theory, which again is this idea that we see color in terms of paired opposites, red, green, yellow, and blue white and black, okay? And that's how we make sense of our color vision to get a perception, okay? Then you have the idea of this retinex theory, which involves contrast, the increase or decrease in an object's apparent brightness by comparison to objects around it, color constancy, tendency of an object to appear nearly the same color under a variety of lighting conditions, and the retinex theory, concept that the cerebral cortex compares the patterns of light coming from different parts of the retina and synthesizes a color perception for each area. So again, there's multiple processes going on for how our brains see movement and color and how vision actually works. Hearing. Okay, again, we're covering all the senses. There's a good amount of biology. And so since this is a nursing school, you guys should be pretty good at this and excited to study some of this. Okay, but here's how hearing works. Okay, so we hear sound waves, vibrations in the air through the water or another kind of, any other kind of medium, but you're just sensing vibrations, okay? And then hertz is this idea of cycles per second. How many times per second does the brain perceive it, okay? And then pitch, perception closely related to frequency, and then loudness, perception of the intensity of the sound waves, okay? So timbre is tone complexity based upon the relative amount of harmonics of the basic tone. And then you have your cochlea, which is fluid-filled canals of the snail-shaped organ, intensifies sound waves into pressure waves, and contains the receptors for hearing. Okay, so these are just some key terms you need going into this. Definitely need to read up a little bit on this before you really can make sense of it. But here we go. Here's how hearing works, okay? So the pinna, this outer ear. Funnels are sound waves, so sound is out here, and the pinna funnels it into our inner ear. This causes our eardrum and our inner ear to start to vibrate, okay? The eardrum is connected to three bones, the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. The hammer is bigger than the anvil, and the anvil is bigger than the stirrup. So as the vibrations go from bigger to smaller bones, it then intensifies the sound, okay? And then the stirrup that um, then transfers the fluid to the cochlea. And here in the cochlea, you're going from air to a, fill, a fluid filled cochlea, okay? So the stirrup then vibrates the cochlea. And in the cochlea, these sound waves then, because you're going from one medium of air to a different medium of, of water, <clears throat> uh, they turn into pressure waves, okay? Which then further amplifies the sound. Within the cochlea, okay, this is where you have hair cells along the basal or membrane, okay? So in that fluid-filled area of the cochlea, that's where you have the hair cells. And then when the waves hit the hair cells in your ears, the hair cells then are connected to neurons, which then get stimulated and then release neurotransmitters to send the information up to your brain along the auditory nerve, okay? <clears throat> so one more time, ear hits the outer part of your ear, go and then uh, your outer part of the ear, funnels the sound to your inner ear, which causes the eardrum to vibrate, okay? That is connected to the hammer, anvil, and stirrup, so then the sound vibrations then go down those bones and get more intense, and then the stirrup bone is then connected to the cochlea, which is a fluid-filled area, so the waves get transferred from air to pressure inside the cochlea along the basal or membrane or hairs. When the hairs get stimulated by the sound waves, the hairs are the receptors, Okay, inside there you have receptors. When the receptors then release neurotransmitters and send the signal to your brain to tell you what you're hearing, okay? So, I wrote it out several times here for you guys just so you understand it. There's a great picture here. So again, uh, it gets funneled into the eardrum. The eardrum vibrates, it hits the hammer, then the anvil, then the stirrup, okay? Then the stirrup then stimulates the cochlea, which contains the basal or membrane. Here are the hair cells along the membrane, okay? And as the vibrations cross here, they stimulate the hair cells, which then send signals to your brain through the auditory nerve. Okay, so pitch perception, the book has some cool ideas on this. So frequency principle, a sound wave through the fluid of the cochlea vibrates all the hair cells, okay? The vibrating hair cells produce action uh, potentials 
okay. And then those action potentials, you know, tell the neuron to release neurotransmitters, which send signals to your brain. Okay. Then the volley principle, the idea that groups of hair cells, just like in the eyes, are waiting for a specific vibration to be released for an action potential, depending on the wave. Okay. And then the place principle, the idea that the highest frequency sound vibrates hair cells near the stir up here and the lower frequency sounds vibrate down here okay so high to low so you have hairs along your basilar membrane that are waiting for specific hertz okay specific wavelengths to stimulate them just like the eyes have blue green and yellow the ear has hairs that are registered in specific receptors for specific hertz okay all right so localizing sounds this is a lot of bit of fun but how is it that we locate a sound source okay we localize the sound source by detecting differences in the time and loudness of the sound in two ears. We localize the distance of a sound source primarily by the amount of reverberation following the main sound, okay? So we compare the time from our left brain to our right brain to determine where the sound is coming from because that can give us a general direction in our brain. So that's pretty interesting. As you can see here, sound left ear right here. What's the time comparison? Then it can tell us if it's out here or if it's out here, it gives us a direction. The vestibular sense is also what you think about with motion sickness. This is the system in your inner ear that detects the tilt and acceleration of the head and orientation of the head with respect to gravity, okay? So again, as you're walking and you orient yourself to the gravity that is pushing down on you and it tells you how much you need to stay in upright. So the vestibular sense plays a key role in posture and balance. And again, it's responsible for motion sickness because you're in motion, so your body and mind are getting a little bit confused. You know, so this enables you to uh, keep your eyes fixated on a target as your head moves, for example. So again, when you're walking and you're looking at a street sign, you know, that's your vestibulary sense. It's keeping you oriented, okay, as you're going. Great. Cutaneous, <laughs> cutaneous senses, <laughs> cutaneous. So the cutaneous senses are your skin senses, okay? And here's what we, you know, these are examples of senses, warmth, pain, itch, vibration, tickle, uh, the senses depend on several kinds of receptors, okay? So pain, this is one of the main feelings. The experience of pain is a mixture of body sensation and emotional reaction, which depend on different brain areas. The gate theory of pain, and that's the picture I have over here, if the gate is open, then the impulses continue to reach the brain. If the gate is closed, they are blocked, okay? So gate theory, the idea that pain messages must pass through a gate, presumably in the spinal cord that can block the messages. Ways to decrease pain, the book talks about distraction, uh, endorphins, and capation, chemicals that stimulate receptors to respond to painful heat. Okay, taste. So here's another one of our senses. It's a sensory system that detects chemicals on the tongue, okay? And so again, what you're going to find is all the sensory systems pretty much work the same way. You have these you know, specific mechanisms, either hairs or taste buds or visual receptors in the eye, and they're all specifically acclimated to respond to a specific type of stimuli, okay? So the tongue responds to five stimuli, sweet, salty, sour, bitter, and unami, okay? These are your taste buds and these are your tongue. And so sweet is in the front, salty is here, sour is on your sides, bitter in the back, and unami is that full flavor, okay? So those are your types of taste receptors, okay? And a taste bud is a fold on the surface of the tongue that holds the taste receptors. Okay, cool. So smell. This, again, if you look at the picture, you see you just have a bunch of dendrites that receive information, okay? And then the information gets sent along the axons to the olfactory ner uh, nerve. So olfaction is defined as the sense of smell. You have olfactory receptors. These detect airborne molecules, so it's specifically oriented to airborne molecules. You have hundreds of different types of olfactory uh, receptors so that you can pick up on all the different types of smells in the environment. Many odors produce strong emotional responses. Uh, olfaction serves important social functions in most non-human animals. I guess your sense of smell is very much uh, part of the social being. You can watch cats and for example, and how they approach each other, and you can kind of get a feel of that, okay? But again, that same thing goes for humans, okay? I mean, olfaction and sense of smell is a very big part. It not only is triggered to memories and all kinds of things, but it's an evolutionary adaptation to keep us safe, to tell us what we're attracted to, etc. So olfaction is more important to our social behavior than we generally acknowledged, okay? All right, 
Sensation and perception is very deep. You know, I try to keep it as short as possible because, again, I can see where it can get long-winded. A lot of it's biology. But the main idea of sensation and reception is that your senses all have receptors that, when stimulated by the right kind of stimuli, then release neurotransmitters. They're connected to neurons, which release neurotransmitters and uh, then send signals to your brain. Okay? And so that's the best thing to take about sensation and perception is how do we hear? Okay, well, hairs in our basal membrane are stimulated by sound waves, okay? And that information gets sent to our brain as a sensation, and then we then perceive the sensations to make sense of it, okay? So for the eyes, light goes into our eyes. We have certain receptors waiting for specific types of wavelengths. And then once we, uh, <clears throat> once the wavelengths, the receptors are stimulated, okay, then neurons then release neurotransmitters to tell the brain what kind of light you're seeing. Uh, smell, you have uh, receptors for uh, airborne molecules. Taste, you have your taste buds and the receptors in the taste buds that are specific for your five different flavors. Okay, so, and then touch, you know, on your hand, you have your hair, which then signals neurotransmitters. You also have uh, pain and, uh, you know, so a lot of good stuff there. So senses are absolutely fabulous. You know, I hope you guys enjoy it. It's like a junior year, a senior year elective in psychology uh, to take this class. And again, you really map out every part of the brain and where it all goes and all the parts of the body and where the receptors are and the different biological um, components that are involved. And it's super interesting. So hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, have a wonderful day and I wish you the best.